Doddle through the Ardennes Forest, really. Win number 63 for Michael Schumacher at his favourite circuit, the circuit where he won his first Grand Prix exactly 10 years ago. Barry Kello, second uh, in his 158th Grand Prix, same as Martin Brundle, that, by the way. We go straight, though. Competitive. They'll be competitive, OK. Don't get greedy, don't get arrogant. That's the message from Ferrari, just that confirmation of the result that uh, we left to go to the press conference for. Once again, Michael Schumacher... Uh, shoveling in the points here again, Montoya up there on the podium, Coulthard fourth, Ralph Schumacher fifth, and what a bonus for Jaguar, Eddie Irvine scoring their first point since the opening race in Australia. The Drivers' Championship, Barrichello now clear second place, Montoya though still hopeful of overhauling him, Williams tend to go well at, uh, at Monza, Ralph Schumacher a couple of points behind, David Coulthard losing a bit of ground in the battle for second place, and Kimi Räikkönen is sixth. And uh, the constructors, of course, Ferrari, comfortably the champions and no change in the pecking order in the Constructors' Championship after round 14. OK, and when you rejoin us, we'll get the views of Mark and Tony. See you shortly. with us at Spa where Michael Schumacher has won the Belgian Grand Prix for the sixth time. Tony Michael Schumacher starting on pole for the first time here in Belgium and getting a decent start and as did David Coulthard by the way. Well there's no real dirty side on the grid here because on the inside it's part of the racing line as well. They used both sides. It was an excellent start by Michael Schumacher but, but enlivened by both the Renault drivers. And the, got to watch Trulli now. He comes right down onto the white line, locks up, nearly loses it there as Rubens has already gone through on the inside of uh, Kimi Räikkönen. David Coulthard had a good start as well. He really sort of toughed it out and sat on the inside. Mark, I think you had a good view from there. Yeah, I mean, DC just does the experience thing, just sits himself back into the inside here, takes the, uh, the apex of the first corner. It's always a tough corner. Down into first gear. Truly really does come unstuck, doesn't he? He tries to make that big run down the outside, but loses a number of places, unfortunately. Truly perhaps trying to compensate for his very poor start in Hungary last time out. Yeah, I mean, Truly is one of these guys who's exceptional in qualifying. It goes into the first corner, doesn't really make the most of it. And Ralph Schumacher's a little bit like that. They're very much alike. We said very nice things about Kimi Raikkonen before the Grand Prix today, but he had a pretty disappointing afternoon, didn't he? Um, proved me wrong, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I predicted it was going to be tough on this, uh, yeah. this race, but it didn't come together. He got, he got pressured, didn't he, by, by one Pablo Montoya and, and had a moment, uh, Mark, where, it, where he got out of shape and did well to keep on the circuit. He really did get out of shape. Watch him go into the corner here. He has a big recovery from that and loses uh, time there to Montoya, who manages to get, get him... Uh, that spot there, look, it's a massive slide, huge. I mean, trying to recover from that takes a lot of effort and skill, but um, a little bit lucky as well. Sure. What, what do you feel about, about Kimi Räikkönen and Tony? Was he a bit overawed, perhaps, being up there on the front row for the first time? Well, they talked about the tyres at the beginning. Other people talked about his inexperience, you know, up against the mighty Ferraris and Schumacher here and whether he could do it or not. But, you know, he just goes for it 110% absolutely flat out from the start. We've seen him in other races. He should have won the French Grand Prix, for example, so he's got it. And it's clear that Ron picked the right guy between him and Heidfeld from Sauber. Choosing Kimi Räikkönen was absolutely the right choice. Perhaps David Coulthard's choice of tyres for the race actually helped him as well. Um, let's look at Anthony Davidson, his last outing for Minardi. And when Louis spoke to him afterwards, he was absolutely furious that he'd made this mistake. Yeah, but I mean, I, he's absolutely gutted by this. Uh, th this is not what he wanted to do. We're talking about a guy who's won the Formula 3 Masters here at Spa. He knows his way around here. So I don't know why he made that mistake, Mark. I think mean, just inexperienced, full stop. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on his shoulders. He knows this is the only race he's got at the moment for the foreseeable future. And uh, he put one wheel wrong and got caught out. You know all about learning the art of Formula One racing. How valuable an experience has these two races in the Minardi been for Anthony Davidson? A lot of experience gained, uh, but unfortunately for Anthony, he didn't finish. And you really do need to finish the Grand Prix. Then people can take a look at you and see if you're going to be a complete driver. He's yet quite to prove that. It's a harsh old word, this, Tony, isn't it? And if people look at Anthony Davidson, said, yep, yeah, all, all very well, but uh, two DNFs. And is that, are they good enough credentials for people to be grabbing him for next season? Well, they remember your non-finishes and say, oh, right, okay, what did he do, looking at the sheets and so on. It's one thing going back to his testing job at Monza next week with BAR, but it's another thing actually racing. They remember that he's gone off twice, but I do feel that he has the talent and uh, he could make it, but he will be kicking himself tonight. He'd be very disappointed. 
It's fair to say that a spa claimed quite a few victims, only 11 running, those engines running at the end. I mean, uh, I think they're in full power at close to 70% of this circuit. A lot of them paid the price of that. Kimi Raikkonen, one of them, Mark. Kimi, a uh, huge blow up there and a uh, huge disappointment for him. But th the problem is these engines are under so much load for so long and uh, inevitable things do give. Yeah, let's have a word with Ron Dennis, the McLaren team boss. Uh, David Coulthard, of course, up there among the scorers. Well, Ron, a very solid fourth place. Could it have been more? I think uh, it would have been a lot more competitive if the uh, ambient temperature was higher. Again, we've uh, really thrown out the window of operation, the tyres, and uh, not, it's not an excuse, just a reason. It would have been better if it was hot. David was right on Montoya's tail at the end there. Were you encouraged by that? Well, I don't think our competition is Williams BMW, actually. I mean, they might be the cars directly in front of us, but we're here to win. And what about Kimi, Kimi's problem? What was it? I had an engine failure, which is pretty apparent. But uh, again, main trouble is just uh, not getting enough heat into the tyres. And are we seeing McLaren back on an upward slope for the end of the season? Well, we come to every race and try and win it, you know, so uh, we're not going to back off. And uh, there are other things which we hope are going to improve the car through the balance of the season. So who knows? Ron Dennis. Well, David Coulthard won here a few years ago. Let's get his view of his performance this time round. David, just slightly too high mountain to climb to get onto that podium today. Yeah, the key was obviously that middle sector and, and obviously the team were on encouraging me to go a bit quicker, but I really couldn't do any more at that time. Uh, inevitably, the last set of tyres felt a bit better because as the track rubbers in, you get more grip and also there's less fuel at the, at the last stint. By then, there's, it was very difficult because when Pablo was, it was quick where it mattered, which was in that middle sector. But on the whole, a positive weekend? Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I think from from a team point of view, we we take a positive from that. We've all moved forward in quality. Um, you, if you look at where we were relative to Williams, obviously Kimi's performance in the soft tyre was was very good as well. We weren't able to use that in in the race, but it uh, could be very useful that sort of performance in Monza. So obviously we'll be working hard with Michelin to try and get the best qualifying tyre we can. Uh, I think I'll probably go for qualifying performance. In saying that, though, Monza, it's there's a strategy that, that most people take there that if you can hang on in there with a good tyre, then that could be the key to winning the race. There's an air among the competitors, the Ferrari's competitors, is they're well and gone. You know, they are miles ahead of the rest. How are the pack going to catch up, Tony? Well, if you take M McLaren, for example, I mean, first of all, th they've made engine developments. There's still this big rumour that Mercedes could take it in-house. But they made a step here, an important step. And they've taken this guy, John Sutton, from Ferrari, who was directly involved with designing this super-duper trick transmission which Ferrari have got. He knows all about it. It's no secret that McLaren next week are testing a new rear end to the car, so they're not giving up the track. And all these components will, of course, be adapted into the 2003 designs. That's what they're working on now. OK, let's uh, look back at, at the race. A couple more incidents. Uh, Giancarlo Fisichella, the Italian. A um, bit of a Roman candle, his uh, Jordan looked like at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, definitely fireworks here. Um, that's a major blow-up. I mean, that's a big mess, I can tell you. It's incredible what goes on with the inertia when those engines blow. I've seen holes in the tarmac being produced. And the big problem, like Martin pointed out in the commentary, is that the engine guys cannot analyse what's left. Yeah. And it's very difficult to them to see what's gone wrong. And what about the driver guys? When you're in there like that and something like that happens, what are your emotions? Um, when it's on fire like that, get out quick. <laughs> but, yes. uh, no, it's basically, you just clutch it, you know, try and slow down as quick as possible, and try and save the engine so that the guys can look at it and analyse it and see what went wrong. Mm. And, and any feelings, Tony, about why so many engines blew up here today? Well, apart from the stress and strain put on a racing engine, you do have to remember that you are also doing your development, particularly Honda, in public, because they've got another two steps to come on their engine. But like other people, they've got their new design all ready for next year and they're working on the new model of it. But whilst you're stressing and trying new things, you take that risk of them blowing up. Everyone's done it. BMW, Mercedes, they've all had those huge embarrassing blow-ups. Sure. There was a, an interesting, uh, before he blew up, an incident involving Giancarlo Fisichella, doing a bit of weaving. Now, I thought you weren't supposed to do that, Mark. Well, no, you're not, but <laughs> Giancarlo actually did a very good job of doing it. Um, I think, you know, morally there is a code between the drivers. One move is uh, OK, more than one move, especially to the other side of the circuit, like we see here. You look, he fades him, Jack gets a little bit concerned and tries to go the other way, and Giancarlo moves across again. 
takes his line, takes the air off the front of his car. Uh, very frustrating and Surpri not proper conduct. Uh, surprised he wasn't punished for that? A little bit, actually, yeah. It's quite blatant there and very obvious on the TV, but um, he got away with it. OK. Well, Jaguar had a good day here today with Eddie Irvine's point. Uh, Nicky Lauder, the team boss, he's had some terrible times uh, this summer, and here he is uh, with Louise. OK. Nicky, was that elation or relief or a bit of both in the Jaguar garage? Mm, a bit of both, because we had a terrible time until now, and at least... Uh, Eddie today did a very good job, finished sixth, so we made one point. Unfortunately, Pedro had a problem with his rear suspension, as we all could see. So we have to see what's wrong there. But it's a bit of a relief, to be honest. Eddie said to us yesterday after qualifying that this really was the team's best chance of getting in the points again. But how confident were you that he could do that? Well, first of all, uh, he did a perfect race. Started in eighth, was eighth on the first lap. Normally, car stop here on this circuit. So two stop then, so therefore he was sixth. It was a tough race for him, but he did the perfect job, and uh, we couldn't expect more. I think he did a good enough job to keep his seat for next year? Uh, this we're going to discuss later, but certainly today he did a very good job. Thanks, Nicky. Good stuff from Jaguar today after a tough season. We've had one or two emails from you about the uh, Belgian Grand Prix. Uh, Helen Rainsford from South London saying, as impressive as Anthony Davidson, the rookie, has been in his first two races, he's spun out of both. Right, Mark, it's, uh, she's put you on that spot here. Will he be back in F1? It's a, it's a difficult question in many respects. Um, I think he's done enough to quantify that he should be in Formula 1 as a driver. I'm just a little bit concerned that the results, you know, the end results, are not being good enough to actually say uh, he should be definitely back in Formula One. And that's, uh, you know, uh, testing is next week for him in BAR. He's got to use that testing now, get more experience, and see whether he can get another break into maybe a Minardi or a smaller team again. But get to the finish of Grand Prix, prove that he can do the distance, and maybe you know outgun his teammate. He's nearly there, but not quite. It's a bit marginal. Okay, another email has come in. Welcome them all, of course. Daniel Stone from London, his 10th win of the season. Michael Schumacher has made history this afternoon. Tony, will anyone ever overhaul his record? Well, again, you know, it, it's tough to say, but we said that when Jackie Stewart had 27. You know, we, we said it when Ayrton Senna got 41, and now Michael Schumacher's got 63. It could be with more races coming up in the future that, you know, a star could emerge. It could be someone like Montoya who could get into this dominant position. And it's the dominance that's taken them. McLaren has been twice dominant. You look at them during the 80s, it was unbelievable. Uh, so somebody could do it. OK, Tony, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, Murray Walker's autobiography is going to be launched next week and you can chat to Murray on the ITV F1 website tomorrow lunchtime. Murray is going to be at the Goodwood uh, Revival meeting. Fantastic meeting it is as well. Friday, Saturday and Sunday. All sorts of great characters are going to be there. One or two of our ITV F1 team as well. Three terrific days. Mr. Sterling Moss, he will be there. Rowan Atkinson be there as well. Who's that fella? James Allen, isn't it? He's going to be riding his bike. And uh, Tony Jardine's going to be taking... That's him in the lime green alpha. Brilliant overtaking move, that. He told me to say that to Tony. Um, Barry Sheen, by the way, he's trying to get along there too. And we all wish him well on his battle with cancer. Highlights tonight from Belgium just before midnight. A couple of weeks' time. Off we go then to Monza qualifying live 11.30 on the Saturday big pre-race show from just after midday and the highlights from just after midnight there we are then a home fixture at Monza Michael Schumacher goes to Ferrari country with another record under his belt see you in a couple of weeks bye bye If you'd like to know more about Formula One, the website address sponsored by Toyota is itv.com slash f1.